Good morning and welcome to our July Coffee Connect. Um, our topic today is Educator Emotional Intelligence. Uh, I am Sarah Gentry. I'm Region 5 Social Emotional and Behavioral Specialist for Nebraska MTSS. Um, I'm going to let my colleagues on the call also um, introduce themselves, but we are missing today Emily, who covers Region 2, ESUs 2, 3, and OPS, and Jill, Region 3, ESUs 1, 7, and 8. Uh, Mackenzie, I'll let you introduce yourself. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I'm Mackenzie Rydell. I am the Social Emotional Behavior Learning Specialist that covers Region 1, so that's ESUs 4, 5, 6, and LPS. And I'm Chandra Essex. I am the SCBL specialist for Region 4, which covers ESUs 9, 10, 11, and 17. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, when we do our Coffee Connects and any of our presentations, it's kind of one of the best signature practices to start off with the welcome and inclusion activity. Um, so in the spirit of July and barbecues and all of the fun things that are summer, um, we wanted to just kind of brainstorm and think about what is your dream burger and what would you like on it? So um, kind of get going in this. I will start, um, if I were to select from this menu here on the screen, I would certainly choose beef. Um, I'm a Nebraska girl, so beef all the way. Um, although I, I don't hate a veggie burger, um, but yeah, if there's beef, I'm obviously going that route. Um, I would put lettuce and I would include seeds on my bun for toppings, ketchup, onion, and cheese. And again, that lettuce. Um, Shandra or Mackenzie, you want to share what you would do? Sure. I also would choose beef because <clears throat> I'm a Kansas and Nebraska girl. I'll say both. Um, and I would go without seeds. I would put on lettuce, tomato, cheese, ketchup, and mayo. I like mayo on it too. Mm -hmm. So I added another one. Yeah. It's funny. It's not on there. How about you, Mackenzie? Um, I would also do beef with seeds and my go-to is ketchup, pickles, and cheese. Um, but if we're going off the options, I would probably do like onion strings or mm. bacon or maybe some like buffalo cream cheese. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So on the screen, we also have a link that we've shared um, the first five. Now we get a lot of our welcome inclusion activities from first five. You can go click on that link in the slides and subscribe. They send you one email a day. Um, that email is full of different resources, different things that you can use in your classroom. Um, if this is a way you want to start your day, or if you're doing PD or with your staff, you want to start your meetings, those kinds of things. Just a great kind of way to break the ice when you're getting things going. And they do not overwhelm you with emails. It's one a day. Um, they take the summer off. So it's one of those that if you subscribe, you're not going to, you're not going to regret it. You get good stuff. Okay. So moving on, um, we always like to include our Padlet link um, in all of our presentations. Our Padlet's full of resources that you can go in and access and utilize. Um, we include all of our previous Coffee Connects. Um, again, just click on that link. So many different SCBL resources, videos. Um, we do have some sections for if you have questions or anything like that, um, please go in and utilize it. Just another great resource that we like to have included. And to start off our conversation, we are including this quote that we thought was really great. Um, Dr. DeSaltis, DeSaltels, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. Um, great author, does a lot of work on neuroscience. Um, she kind of talks about our emotions and we love this quote because it really brings back um, kind of what our philosophy is with MTSS that um, this is the work of the adults. And when we're thinking about behaviors, um, thinking about behavior management, we kind of highlighted that part in here. It's really not so much about the students. It's really about the adults first. Um, so the quote's kind of long. I'll read it real quick. Um, emotions are contagious. We all see and experience this when we unintentionally enter a power struggle or conflict with a student. Behavior management isn't about the student. It's about me. If I'm feeling rough and dysregulated, I become the mirror and reflection for those students who become increasingly irritated, defiant, oppositional, or shut down. 
And so we really just wanted to kind of ground us in this is work that we're talking about for ourselves when we're thinking about our emotional, our own emotional intelligence and the emotional intelligence of our educators. So again, a little more work um, from the same from the same kind of resource. Thinking about educators, we go first. So. Um, we're always going to repair and prioritize the relationships. We've got to start that process before we before we um, are expecting our students to do that. We're teaching them and modeling. We're saying sorry. We're acknowledging and holding ourselves accountable. Um, being aware of what our own triggers are um, so that we can kind of set some things in place to prevent different things from happening and prevent our own emotional responses uh, from being something that's negative. Uh, regulating our own nervous systems and focusing on the process. So these are just some things that we want to do before we expect those things from our students. And then our own definition, our NEMTSS de definition of social, emotional, and behavioral learning. Um, really what we like to talk about is it's really that systemic process. So building those skills amongst our adults in our buildings, our students, um, and doing that through um, creating our safe environments with PBIS, our, our positive behavior expectations. We've got an example on that page. Um, thinking about the positive uh, mental health outcomes for everybody. So we know that there's a lot of mental health that intersects with social, emotional, behavioral learning. Um, we've got our skills star on the slide. Those are kind of the SEBL skills that we really like to focus on. Um, and we've kind of built out and spent a lot of time working on. And then how all that is kind of links up with our um, career readiness standards. So it's kind of our overarching definition of what social, emotional, and behavioral learning is at NEMTSS. And this is our skills web. This is kind of relatively new. Um, I think we launched it maybe four or five months ago, um, but it took about a little over a year for our team to build this out. The five different skills that we really um, like to focus on our self-awareness, self-management, problem-solving skills, our relational skills, and then our pro-social behaviors. And we built this chart out to kind of be a visual so that our, our educators can take a look at it and think, SCBL is really happening. I'm really teaching these things already in my classroom. Um, and then identifying those things maybe that they need to work on and improve what is, what is an area that I'm not really focusing on in my classroom or where am I seeing some challenges with my students? Um, and we've built this out and, and all of our Coffee Connects, we talk about it, all of our presentations, we talk about it. And each of those skills we've kind of built out. Um, there's other charts that we've built out um, and kind of expanded on these thoughts and, and skills and giving some resources and things to use to um, support that work in the classroom. So in 1990, the conversation for emotional intelligence really got started. Um, Peter Salavoy and John Mayer, they, they had done some research and they published this paper that they um, that was launched, kind of became the, the milestone or the pivotal piece in the conversation about what emotional intelligence is. And in that, they, this was the definition that they identified for emotional intelligence. Um, they, they called it the ability to perceive accurately, appraise and express emotion, the ability to access and or generate feelings when they facilitate thought, the ability to understand emotion and emotional knowledge, and the ability to regulate emotions to promote emotional and intellectual growth. Now that definition includes, I mean, it's a, it, it encompasses so many different things, but really we kind of highlighted the pieces that we thought were as we went through and we were researching and building this out, um, that that ability to access and regenerate your feelings um, when they're facilitating different thoughts, um, understanding emotions and not only your emotions, but the emotions of other people. And then that ability to regulate emotions. Um, those were kind of the key points that we felt were really important when we were thinking about emotional intelligence. And then these five skills there to the left, um, the social skills, self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, and motivation, those are all skills that are identified within the research. Um, anybody that has those skills has strong emotional intelligence. Um, so we wanted to kind of tie those in and really kind of talk about the, the skills that we've identified for social, emotional, and behavioral learning and how emotional intelligence just kind of fits all within the context of the same kind of thing. So self-awareness, self-management, pro-social behavior, and those social skills kind of tie in together. Um, self-awareness and self-regulation um, and problem solving, those all kind of go together. And then all of it with that relationship. So empathy um, fits in there, 
self-management and motivation, they just kind of tie in together. So really when we're thinking about emotional intelligence, it really kind of encompasses all of the various social, emotional, and behavioral learning skills that we talk about all the time. Now thinking about why, why do we wanna make sure that our teachers have high um, emotional intelligence? So thinking about that, when we talked about earlier on uh, as being the educators and going first, we're thinking about the importance of our teachers being able to recognize and regulate their emotions, being able to recognize the emotions that are happening with their students and other stakeholders so that they can do those things like build trusting relationships, um, improve student engagement, and then really generating that stakeholder support. Those are all super important pieces um, in our education journey and making sure that our teachers have the skills that they need for that. Um, reflecting and monitoring on their own behavior. So that self-awareness piece is very, very big on emotional intelligence. That's what we need. Um, of course, that's gonna improve their self-efficacy, uh, professional competencies, all of those things that we really want. Um, and then we wanna make sure that our, our educators are flexible and adaptable. Are they able to overcome these new things that happen? There's never two days in education that go the same. So how do our teachers adapt and respond to the various challenges that come into their classroom every day? So as Sarah just talked about those benefits of high teacher EL or EI, um, <clears throat> this, this graphic talks about four different areas and it's based on uh, a number of different research components. So the first one that we think about if we look at that increased self-efficacy so that teachers with high EI, um, it's relevant to that so that they can improve their performance and their efficacy in the classroom. Similarly, when we think about a higher EI, they tend to exhibit that high level of self-efficacy. Um, there's a study that participants demonstrated a greater motivation to teach with fewer intentions to quit the profession when you have that high EI. Um, teachers with high EI and burnout um, have also been explored. So in a time that we are at when we think about education and the teaching the lack of teachers, the lack of subs. We want to think about um, <laughs> we want to think about how we help um, each other, and so that empirical finding shows that teachers with high scores in the highest level of dimensions of EI show lower levels of exhaustion or burnout. So again, thinking about what's that motivation and that commitment that leads into less exhaustion and burnout, and then overall, it's improved job performance. Um, so as you think about what those components were that Sarah talked about in regards to EI, which is self-efficacy or self-awareness and empathy, social skills, those are tied directly into that less burnout um, and that improved job performance because teachers have the energy and the focus and the persistence to, to work through what's happening in their classrooms every day. <clears throat> <clears throat> So how do we improve those AI skills as teachers? So trying to slow down your reactions to emotions. So again, thinking about this is how, um, this is the work we do for our adults so that we can model what we want our students to be doing. So when you feel angry, try to sit down before you lash out. Um, think about why are you angry? What did somebody do to upset you? What do you think was the emotions underneath their behavior? Um, Again, when we're driven by emotion, sometimes it's just a reaction. And so we wanna think about really what's the intention behind it as best as we can and to pause. That next piece is reflecting on what your strengths are, your areas for growth, um, and what's your weaknesses. Knowing yourself really can help with your emotional intelligence around others. What are your triggers going to be um, and how you can let everybody else around you and play into your strengths. So. Um, just knowing yourself, knowing when to ask for help or to offer help. Um, again, thinking about that it's not always a malicious intention that people are coming from when they're thinking about their emotions. Um, sometimes it's just a reaction. And so paying attention to others' nonverbals. Um, we know that nonverbal communication is just as important, sometimes more important, um, especially if it's out of alignment with what we are saying. So if you ask someone to help on a project and they agree, but they sound hesitant, maybe recognize that they might be feeling overwhelmed or confused, 
Um, they might come from a different background or understanding that's different than yours. And so it's important to address that and validate <coughs> um, that feeling before moving on and giving others permission maybe to not help with something. Maybe they feel like they have to. Um, again, it's that recognition of how others are um, and that self-awareness for you and that leads into your high EI. And then finally, working on communicating effectively and openly. Um, sometimes this is a skill that people have and sometimes this is not. Um, so working on where your strengths are, maybe um, improving your, your challenges, but being very clear and cut dry information um, is relevant to the person you're talking to and giving your full attention when somebody is speaking. Um, we think about how many distractions we have when it comes to technology. Um, we're focusing and we're thinking in the back of our mind what's happening there, um, what's happening outside of the classroom, but really diving in and focusing when somebody is speaking, giving full attention to our students, our peers. Um, depending upon what environment we're in is really an important component. So the next slide talks about emotional dysregulation. It occurs when the brain responds to the sensory input in a manner that triggers an alarm state. Um, dysregulation of the brain is something that happens um, very quickly uh, it, because it's registering those emotions um, and it's having that reaction to it. So responding to those emotions in an appropriate context sometimes is very difficult to do if your brain is dysregulated. Um, and you, knowing what those regulating emotions are in a social situation, it, we have learned those maybe over time. But if we haven't had good examples of how to control our emotions or how to react in an appropriate setting, um, then sometimes that dysregulation will take over. <clears throat> and so thinking about, again, what Sarah had talked about of we are the role models as adults in the classroom for our students. So if we're role modeling, how do you still make decisions if you're emotionally dysregulated? We'll show students how they can do it. And so Emotional dysregulation comes from, I, the thing I want to point out is those triggers in an alarm state. So we thinking about, again, what's the environments that we're coming from? What are our experiences that we've had? We think about an ACEs score, if there has been some trauma, if there have been some experiences that maybe will trigger an emotional response to a situation that we don't even realize is going to happen. Um, and so it's giving some grace and helping students understand that their emotional dysregulation will happen, but how do we, how do we really respond to it? So in this diagram, it talks about there's three areas and three reasons, the physical, the emotional, and the sensory. Um, when we think about emotional regulation, it's kind of like that volume control on your feelings. So when your volume control for the device is high, um, because it's been is too loud around you, that emotional de dysregulation that your brain can't regulate those emotional signals. So everything is on high volume, how you respond, what, what your environment's going to look like. And so being able to control that volume um, sometimes doesn't always work like it should. So you want to think about how you can make your emotions maybe not as loud or louder, depending upon the situation, thinking about it can be harder to manage if you're in a dysregulated state. So if we think about an example um, for learning, an example of learned emotional regulation is how children will eventually outgrow temper tantrums. Um, if you have children or smaller kiddos in your classroom as they're developing um, during childhood, we think about that tantrums are normal and an expected part of your child's development, but as they get older, they generally learn how to manage those emotions. That's why those tantrums become less frequent and will eventually stop. So again, it's what those reasons kind of look like. There are a lot of triggers as we think about what are some ways that potentially we get sensory overload. And again, sensory was a piece of those reasons. Um, and so thinking about in your classroom, what are some uh, sensories that can help lessen the emotional dysregulation components? So are there bright flashing lights, bright colors, decorative displays, busy decor, clutter? Sometimes that can be an impact um, to somebody's emotional regulation. So we wanna think through that. Again, understanding that it's a environment 
for our students to learn best, to feel energized. So there is a balance there. Um, you know, strong smells, air fresheners, perfumes, um, cleaning agents, oil diffusers. If you think about how we react to smells, memories, when certain smells come up, again, can impact how we um, are able to control our emotional dysregulation. Um, I think about my daughter who has like an uber sensitive smell and she will smell something. Oh, that smells good, mom. And I'm like, I don't even know what she's talking about. So thinking about how your students might be picking up on smells and then how you also are picking up on smells and how that's impacting your emotions. Sound is the next one. So those fans. Um, multiple voices, maybe music, and then thinking about what's the physical. So are there chairs, tags on clothing, um, too tight? You know, what is the, what's the physical touch component? Um, that those can all be possible triggers for that sensory overload. And then if we think about physical dysregulation, um, <clears throat> so when are we hungry or thirsty, lack of sleep, physical or mental illness, infection, lack of exercise, nutrient deficiency? Um, we know in our classrooms and for ourselves that when students become hangry, um, I'm sure everybody knows that word, <laughs> hopefully you're, you're hungry and then you can get angry, um, it's hard to focus. It's hard to keep your emotions in check when you are hangry. Because again, thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that psych physiological needs are that base. So air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, reproduction, like all of those things are in there. Um, and if you can't be physically regulated, then it's hard to be emotionally regulated. Um, those two go hand in hand. So when we talk next about emotional, emotional dysregulation, those are the trauma, the stress, the anxiety, feeling unsafe, change in routine, excitement, and anger. Um, when your brain can't regulate emotional signals, then it is hard to control that volume of your feelings. So when you're dysregulated, your brain makes emotions louder and harder to manage, which we talked about earlier. And that is information that comes from Cleveland Clinic. So we know that when um, the things around us are impacting us physically, mentally, and emotionally, then it's gonna be very hard again to, to regulate that. And if we think again about Maslow's, this is that next step up. It's those safety needs. Um, the personal security, the employment, the resources, the health, the property, all of those can tie into that emotional dysregulation. And safety is a very big piece of that. Feeling unsafe can put a student, can put a teacher um, into a state of emotional dysregulation, which then it's hard to try to learn in that type of an environment. <clears throat> when we think about emotional regulation, we've talked about those triggers um, the physical dysregulation, the emotional. So we wanna also think about what's our window of tolerance. Um, and so looking at those, what's your breaking point and understanding that as yourself um, and what's your window of acceptance based on maybe what are your hot button topics? What are your experiences? What have those been? So an example might be, you know, principal asked her staff when they make a referral, write the referral on a scale of one to five of where they were at in their frustration or their tolerance level, a one to five on their calmness level, um, to gauge, maybe to help themselves understand that the impact of their own state of um, frustration and tolerance can impact how you are um you are interacting, you are re reacting to your students. So it can then impact like the number of referrals made that can give, that can impact a student's um, learning in the classroom or outside of the classroom. So giving yourself time to pause, to reflect, whether it's a problem with the child or is it a problem with your own tolerance level and understanding that this may fluctuate without, throughout the day because of your emotional intelligence, because of the physical and the emotional dysregulations that are there. So we wanna talk about that vulnerable decision point. So I don't know if many of you um, understand this or have been introduced to this type of a topic, but research defines VDP as that contextual event or elements of the immediate situation that affects discipline decision-making. 
So it happens when the decision is um, it, based on what the what the elements are around it. So basically that VDP um, is when our decisions are more likely influenced by our unconscious limiting views. So our experiences or views that might impact how we react to others. Maybe it's a quick decision um, that you've made based on information you've collected from your past experiences. Again, but in general, that VDP happens when a decision might be ambiguous or uncertain um, for you or for your students. So again, thinking about when we're hungry or we're tired um, or we're afraid, how we react to the problem um, is going to impact how we respond to somebody. So understanding after the problem, what is that vulnerable de decision of what's going to do, what's going to happen next. We don't always choose the when, the where, the what of the problem, but we definitely get to choose to pause, which is the next part of that graphic, um, so that we can choose a neutralizing routine that can help us have a positive response. So when we think about that vulnerable decision point, um, we want to remember that we are not always at our best when we are hungry, when we're tired, when we feel unsafe. And so we want to think about a vulnerable decision point as kind of like that stoplight. What's the problem? What is vulnerable about us to be able to make a dis effective decision in that time? We want to pause so then we can choose a neutralizing routine that will help us have a positive response. So neutralizing routines, um, that is that ability to self-manage strategy, to think about how in the moment in this routine where you've identified you all vulnerable to reacting or your, um, your choices, maybe your experiences have determined how you're going to act or react, is is looking at. So um, you want to make sure that you pause first and foremost before you respond to a challenging behavior. Um, I know sometimes there are, we said we've talked about triggers. I think about my six-year-old daughter. Um, there are some situations that I should pause in <laughs> when dealing with her before I respond. Um, I kind of skip over this neutralizing routine part and the pause and so I know my reaction is not going to be as beneficial. Um, so it takes practice. We have to really think about um, where we are at in that moment and 100% being focused on what our response will be because the, the goal is to decrease the amount of times you are just reactive and it gives you that ability to be autopilot when things get stressful that it gives you the ability to pause and to think about, okay, why am I going to react this way? Is it because of a past experience, because of um, what is surrounding us? And then how can I choose a routine? So is it um, a deep breath? Is it uh, walking away from the situation to then be able to come back and to give a pr productive, supportive behavior towards the student that's gonna align with their values? Um, so thinking about how we do this is really important to get ourselves back on track so that we can really continue to move forward. So when we think about a neutralizing routine, you might want to ask yourself, to what extent have I taught the student that expected behavior? Again, thinking about that prevention is key. So we want to teach, teach, teach. So again, what makes that good neutralizing routine? It's those win then statements, um, delay a decision until you can think clearly. So maybe it's saying, see me after class, or maybe at the next break, ask the student to reflect on their feelings and behavior. We want to reframe that situation. Maybe you say, I, I respect you, but that behavior is not okay in our classroom. Can you tell me how we do things in our school? Again, thinking about how you taught them, what is the prevention of teaching and reteaching them? giving them those clear steps, making sure they're doable, and then interrupting that chain of events. Again, thinking about that pause. Um, taking care of yourself is really important when you're thinking about that, that step of a vulnerable decision point, and then that neutralizing routine. You want to take two breaths. Model a class-wide um, class cool-down strategy. 
So is it okay? We know that things are tense and things are, um, we're reacting emotionally right now. Let's all take a deep breath, stand up and stretch, um, get your brain and physically engaging your body so that it will help regulate your brain. And then finally, we want to think about those, um, the three R's. So what are those three R's to success? So we want to recognize, again, knowing your hot buttons, use the data to help identify what those vulnerable decision points might be, to regulate, identify, or developing neutralizing routines for your pause, um, shifting from that reacting to the responding, and then repeat, practice, practice, practice. Make it a norm for you in your classroom. We know that the more we practice something, the more it becomes second nature. And then that helps interrupt that natural response we might have and create a new path of a response. Um, so when we're dysregulated, we can get back to regulation in a faster model. All right, I'm gonna bring us home. Um, so we're just gonna go through an example of what a vulnerable decision point can look like. Um, and just keep in mind that we identify and we come across vulnerable decision points multiple times every single day in various different situations. And so really, like Shandra talked about, um, it's kind of revolving around that self-awareness and that self-management, those um, social emotional behavioral skills, because it does take intention and it takes practice, um, but it starts with that identification. Um, and the whole point of thinking about and learning and reflecting on vulnerable decision points is to help us gain more control and awareness. So we're able to shift into responding intentionally to things that happen instead of reacting to things that happen. Because as you know, um, you probably feel it in your everyday. Um, as you go throughout your day, sometimes of the day are easier. Sometimes you might be running out of patience or even like times of year. I think of um, February is a really long month because there's often not a lot of breaks and we often see um, rises in our behavioral data during that time. Um, and so using that information to sit back and reflect and say, hey, what can we do to be more proactive, to be able to respond maybe preventatively or respond more effectively when things are happening um, that can be more effective, that can create safer communities for our um, school building. And so the scenario here, um, you're reflecting on your data and maybe just how you're feeling and you realize that your content block before lunch often has more office referrals. So say you're in a middle school and your, your eighth grade lunch is the latest lunch at 1230 and you have the last period before that and it's always just a little bit squirrely and everyone's kind of hungry and you're just really ready for a break. Um, and your data is showing you that there's more office referrals. So maybe the behaviors are up in that classroom, yes. And maybe that's a vulnerable decision point for those split decisions when you might be able to benefit from that pause and that neutralizing routine. So now that you've understood and you've reflected, you, under, you understand that's that vulnerable piece, that vulnerable point. Um, so moving forward, you're going to think about how can you utilize neutralizing routine um, during that time. So um, intentionally thinking and planning about what you're going to do, anticipating that time is common for vulnerable decisions. Um, and so then you, um, during that time, you would pause when you see you're kind of running low on patience or things are happening and use that neutralizing routine. So just an example of what that could look like is walking away, going to a different part of the room, and then maybe coming back and having a private conversation with the student. Um, so what this might be different from before that pause, maybe before you went through this process of thinking and reflecting, is calling the student out maybe in front of the class or across the room or um, the way that you're using your language might be more like, I don't like it when you're talking to me. And then after 
that reflection and using that neutralizing routine, you're able to come back, have a private conversation, maybe use some more effective language. So identifying what are we valuing in our classroom and how does that impact um, our classroom environment? Um, and ultimately those conversations will have a more positive result because you're intentionally responding to whatever's happening in your classroom instead of reaching that vulnerable decision point and then reacting, which results in a more negative result. Um, and if you're really into vulnerable decision points and neutralizing routines, or you wanna learn a little bit more, um, the Teach by Design um, PBIS Apps podcast has a couple different podcast episodes that were relatively recent. Um, one is on vulnerable decision points, and then the second one is on neutralizing routines. Um, so we're just gonna go through a few more examples. Shander kind of ran through these earlier, um, but just some ideas on what a neutralizing routine can look like. Um, but when we're thinking about neutralizing routines, it's not like one works for all. It's just figuring out like what works best for you to be able to take that pause and kind of um, regulate yourself before you're responding to um, the situations. So um, this one is just try with an acronym um, T, take three deep breaths, R, recognize your emotion, and Y, act in the youth's best interest. Um, so if, if you're being really intentional and planning about um, how are you using those neutralizing routines, um, then you can just kind of whip this out through practice of using that in the moment. The next example is delaying the response. Uh, I think sometimes we use this a little more naturally. Um, and so having that one-on-one um, -on -one conversation, hey, let's talk after class or at the next break, let's have a conversation instead of trying to talk in the moment. Um, asking the student to reflect on their feelings or behavior, maybe using some of those restorative questions, um, what's going on, how are you feeling, how might others be feeling. Um, you can use that moment and that pause to self-reflect, to think about your values and the values and expectations of your school and then kind of gather your thoughts for how that conversation might look. Um, and also self-talk is so powerful. Um, so being able to use self-talk just to remind yourself like, all right, I'm gonna take a moment and I'm gonna have a conversation in a little bit and that's gonna be more effective than me talking right now. Um, and I know this can be difficult to do in the moment. Um, I know I find myself using self-talk a lot with my toddler because um, it's easy to um, both get um, kind of that back and forth, which never goes well. Um, and so self-talk is a great strategy that I personally like to use a lot. And the next strategy is circling back. And so if you're imagining a circle in your mind, um, you have the problem, you're walking away, maybe you help somebody else. Um, Maybe just take that pause again. All of these kind of have a pause incorporated in them and then walk back around and come back to the student and maybe have that conversation or give some redirects or give some um, prompts and reminders um, of what that skill that you might want to see is. And the next one is reframing the situation. Um, so this is all about that getting curious about what's going on and not curious. I mean, also having that um, high expectations for your student and being able to use supportive language that fosters um, those relationships and that repair rather than a blame and shame when things do happen. Um, and so I respect you in our classroom. We value respect. And then talking about how the behavior might be out of alignment with those values. Um, asking the student to come be part of the conversation. So um, let's talk about our expectations at school and what that looks like, and then give them the opportunity to share. Um, assuming that your student is giving their best effort and their needs aren't being met. And so instead of, um, putting that blame on the student and assuming they're doing things maybe on purpose 
um, reframing that in your mind of saying, okay, what needs aren't being met that I can do better at meeting those needs. Um, responding as if the student was physically injured. Um, I think sometimes we get into the um, thoughts of like, oh, they know better, they should do better. Um, but then like taking that step back. And I know when we're escalated, that's really hard. Um, but taking that pause and then reframing it often gives you more of a response than a reaction. And then responding, reminding yourself um, that school behaviors might look different than home behaviors. And maybe that opportunity, that teachable moment of these are the expectations and the things we value in our school and our classroom. And that might look different than the expectations and the values in your home and community. Um, and then uh, just a little reminder to take care of yourself um, because we know that we need that co-regulation. Um, students have a really difficult time regulating if their adults in their environment aren't regulated. And so being able to recognize your feelings and your emotions and your tolerance level and being able to intentionally kind of bring yourself down from that or being aware of when you need help, when you need to call, call somebody in or maybe tap out um, for a minute or even utilize that modeling strategy for your whole class. Maybe you do a class step, class-wide cool down strategy or a go noodle or, or something where your whole class gets to experience that pause. Um, and then we just have a couple of resources for you on this last one, mindfulness micro practices. If you click on that link, there's a ton of different examples of some, they call them micro practices. So they're quick and easy practices for mindfulness. Um, and we like to talk about mindfulness as being paying attention on purpose to the present moment. Um, so it doesn't have to be like this whole big, I'm gonna have a dark room and I'm gonna do some meditation and like be mindful. It can really just be like, as you're arriving for the day, like how are you intentionally paying attention to um, what's going on in the present moment. So you can really hit that like baseline of regulation. Um, so that link has a great uh, couple examples that you can use. And then this last slide here is just a couple books to support the work. Um, if you're wanting to learn a little bit more, um, we have three different books, Emotional Intelligence for School Leaders, um, connections over compliance and permission to feel. Um, I'm a big fan of permission to feel. It's a really good book. I almost finished it and then my dog ate it. Um, ate it enough to where I probably should just buy a new one, but I haven't quite yet. Um, but I like to give a good shout out to that book there. And then as always, we like to start with our welcoming activity and end with our optimistic closure. And so I'm just thinking about what is something that's still circling in your mind and what can you do to help calm, understand, or resolve that thought. So that's just a personal reflection. We'll have you do that. Um, and then you all can go about your day. Um, and then just our contact information. Um, if you have questions or if you need any support, you can always reach out to us and we would be happy to come and help you out. Um, in your schools. Thank you.